Okay, so so we're at Bernie Grunman Mastering again. I, I seem to live here every couple of couple of months, and we're here for the mastering on vinyl of a brand new production that Groove Note Records is doing, and it is called Vanessa Fernandez when the levee breaks. And since this is not yet pressed, this is what we have. We have this artwork here. It's a mock-up. It's a mock-up, and so uh, this is an album of. Led Zeppelin songs reimagined by uh, Vanessa and some some uh, third rate musicians like uh, Jim Keltner. Who else is on this? Tim Pierce on guitar. Really? Formerly Jane's Addiction on bass. And uh, who else? Louis Conte on percussion. And uh, Jim Cox on keyboards. And Charlie Bisharat. Okay. So you you produced this was your concept. You yeah yeah. Um, after the first album, uh, talked to Vanessa about a follow up album and um, discovered that she was a big Led Zeppelin fan, and we figured that that might be a, a interesting concept to pursue, and we decided to do a Led Zeppelin cover album. Spent a year plus picking the songs and stuff and. Uh, this is the result. And and you recorded this at, at the former Ocean Way, which is now called well, United. Yeah, we, we used uh, Studio B over there. And, uh, now that was originally called United before it became it Ocean Way, right? Um, United Recordings, right? Yeah. United Western. United Western. United Western, yeah. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that where Bill Putnam was? That's, That's where Bill right. Putnam was. He yes. built that studio yeah, yeah, originally, yeah. 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 And so, uh, now let's talk about why I c I'm here to watch this because it's fun, but also you, you originally had a very interesting and unique way that you were going to produce this record. It's all done to tape. Yeah. It's multi-track analog tape yeah. mixed down to tape, but you were originally going to do what? We were originally going to do a so-called director disc cut based on something Bernie had done about 20, 30 years ago for Supertramp when he was over at the Ocean Way facility and they could run cable from the, the studios, the mixing rooms, straight to his, um, his uh, mastering studio. And I heard a Super Tramp cut uh, called, uh, what was it called, Cannonball, that uh, Bernie did a direct director disc cut. And we were thinking we would get a mobile mixing studio, park it out front, run a cable from the, uh, the mixing board um, with, a, with a 24 track machine straight into Bernie's cutting room and cut direct. But so you'd say you'd save a generation, in other words, because you wouldn't be least, yeah, mixing generation. to tape. You'd, yeah. you'd be mixing to lacquer. Yeah, yeah. And um, we, we really wanted to make it happen, but there were a lot of logistical problems, insurance problems, and we just couldn't get the paperwork done. And, and actually, Mike and I also, after we came out of the tracking session, we, we kind of figured like this was going to be, you know, it was just the, the material was so good. What we had recorded during the, the tracking sessions was so good, but some of it was complex, and we didn't think this on-the-fly mastering that we would have had to do direct to using the, 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 the kind of direct to this concept would have been so useful. And, it, you know, what, what Bernie had cut for Supertramp was a single. It was one song. It was just so, one And song. you would have been trying to cut a side of a record. Six sides, yeah. But uh, with two songs, so yeah. it's not as bad as if it was six songs yeah. on a side. Yeah, and, uh, and you'd be mixing live. So exactly. the upside is you would save a generation. The downside is you wouldn't be able to perform as, as concise and perfect a mix yeah, as you were able to. Exactly. And so you produced it the way every great, most great records that have yeah. ever been made were produced. So it shouldn't be too bad. And from what I heard, it doesn't suck. Yeah. Well, I think Mike Ross in particular was really happy because he, he would have been the mixing engineer and he knew that it was going to, you know, we, we went into Studio A at Ocean Way, uh, United, and that's where they have that really big um, board, the, the custom built board there. And it's a great board. Everything sounded really good going through it. And it's a shame you know, not to use it, right? Yeah, and we had five full days there. And so Mike was really able to work on a couple of tracks a day. You know, yeah. And it, uh, I think it turned out really well. You know. And well, that's for you. That's for me to decide, yeah, not you. Well, all right. Yeah. Okay. And so, so now we're here, and we have the tape. Tapes are going to be put up on yeah. on Bernie's uh, Studer. With custom electronics, right? Oh, You're yes, not using yes, uh, exactly. what the studio has. Yeah, no, you made no. your own. <laughs> no. Uh, in fact, this has even been rebuilt in case we want to take 14-inch reels. The machine was never built to take it. 
but uh, these machines, the underneath these machines were built to handle all the way up to the two inch tape. But as, as a quarter inch and a half inch machine, the, uh, and even though with the beginnings of uh, multi-track, the two inch machines wouldn't take large reels. But in mastering, of course, if you have a 30 IPS, like this is a 30 IPS quarter inch tape, if you have that uh, format, a side of an LP is going to uh, be a lot, a lot of tape, and you need the large reels. So we had we had uh, our machinist do, do some reconstruction of wow. this uh, deck underneath, and then build and put new plates on, new uh, aluminum plates. And they were, of course, the Stuhler people were horrified when they, of course, <laughs> when they heard about what we had done. But they came and looked at it, and they they thought, "Wow, you know," <laughs> they were actually impressed in the end yeah. that we were able to accomplish this. So now this machine, which is one of the great old uh, analog machines in the history of recording, is this an A80? Is it? Or it's an A80. Yeah, yeah, it's an A80, and. Uh, Really, I don't know if anything's gotten any better than this. Yeah. And so, your, but it's your custom electronics. So, but uh, but yeah, we also use uh, a special head that's actually made in uh, California, I believe. Yeah, hmm. the Flux Magnetics head, oh, yeah. which is a very good uh, playback head, and and the electronics. Yes, the electronics are uh, vacuum tube oh. with an interface with a, uh, a solid state interface, but they're all custom made by us. Yeah, and and. And our philosophy, of course, is is right in line with uh, what most audiophiles uh, aspire to, and that is less is more. Right. And we're always trying to uh, do it as get what we want, but do it in a simple way, much more a very straightforward way, uh, and and not necessarily relying only on theory, because I'm I'm a big believer in. The only way you're ever going to be sure is to listen to it. Listening, but we 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 are as human beings, we are not capable of listening. We we are easily well, fooled. Well, if you're a, a technical person, you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> you're but technically we, not but, a person. What do you say? We've approved that. We we proved to them even uh, many times uh, that we're hearing things that they can't believe we're hearing. But we but we could but we can point out things like the differences in uh, digital copies and so forth. And they're, they're, they'll swear they can't hear the difference, but we pick it out every time. Right. So there must be something to it, and they're they're all scratching their head. So, uh, no, I'm a firm believer in really the only thing that's going to be ultimate uh, decision on, on the quality of something, or even just like what I consider a personality almost, of certain uh, pieces of equipment, is to listen to it. And you have a track record going back at least five years in this business, right? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could add a zero even, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, for Almost. yeah, a number of years, I've been through a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. I've been, and I've seen all of the changes and so-called changes that were supposed to be great and improvements that weren't improvements, and then things that were improvements. You know, so that's it. You have to pick and choose. You can't go by what everyone's telling you or what what they think is supposed to happen, because even some of the things that we've constructed and we've we felt that we were going to be improving a circuit. When we compare it to the original one, we don't like it. We don't even like what we do sometimes. But that's the final word, is what does it sound like? How does it compare? And you really have to keep referencing yourself, too. You have to yes. keep going back and listening to what you had before to make sure you're actually getting something better. I agree. Which is why somebody, one of my trolls who hates me and keeps writing, you know, following me online, and writing, he says, your problem is you listen. <laughs> That's what he said. That is what he said. Your problem is you listen. Yeah. Because yeah. wow, uh, just what a concept. What a <laughs> I know. Uh, less is more. Um, thing well, we are like in the listening business. That's what you I. Know, we, uh, yeah. we, That's how we. That's what we do with music. We don't eat it. <laughs> yeah. We yeah, listen. We're not to sitting it. there looking at graphs. Right. But you're imp they're important too. I mean, you do. Well, yeah. But you know, actually, you know, it's like sometimes in order to make a piece of equipment really flat and really perform uh, like theoretically the best, like a response or something being perfectly flat, in order to make it do that sometimes, you interfere with the quality of that. It might be flat, but what's the quality of that flat? And you'd rather have it less flat and more simplified so that the quality was there. You would enjoy the music much more. Right, and that's what it's about. It's about that's enjoy. what it's about. And it's so today we're gonna to enjoy this music while you do your thing and you've gone through the tapes 
uh, yesterday, yeah, yeah. and you know you now. What if you 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 you're going to do certain changes to what's on the tape before you cut the lacquer? Certain things you've decided to do. Yeah, like what? Well, there, well, there are okay. So we, in particular, there's there's uh, as as a, a lot of people aren't fully aware of this. But when it comes to vinyl, I mean, vinyl can be absolutely fantastic because it's very natural sounding. But because it's a mechanical process and it's basically originally very primitive, you know, it's what Edison came up yeah. with. You know, it's just a mechanical thing. And because of that fact, because you have something mechanical trying to follow this really complex signal in the groove, it does have limitations. And it will sound different depending on the cartridge you have and the compliance of the cartridge, how well that stylus can fit in the groove and follow every little nuance of the groove. So we try to have a fairly good, we don't want to dumb things down too far or anything like that. So we have a fairly good high quality playback system, but not the $10,000 cartridge. Right. You know, so, but, but we want to make it, uh, we want to make it track well. Uh, so that uh, we don't run into some of these limitations that vinyl has. Uh, CDs, uh, digital, the digital formats only have one limitation, and that's peak level. Uh, and then you get uh, clipping and so forth if you exceed that level. Which doesn't mean that they're perfect, what you get no, no, is perfect. No, no, I'm just saying that's the limitation. Right. Now, right. it does have its own personality and sound to it, and it always sounds, to me, slightly artificial. But that's because there's a lot of conversions of various things going on with digital. But with vinyl, it's different. It's a mechanical thing. It's, and it's because it was old technology, the disc changes linear speed. So because of that, the density of the information, of say the same information in, in, on the outer revolution, if you had the same information on an inner revolution, you'd have one-fourth the space to put it in. Okay, when you think about it, all that, it's very, it's analog. It, it's, it's a miniatures, miniaturization of what you want the speaker to do. So that groove is moving and telling the speaker what to do. It's being amplified, it's very minute, but you've got a lot of density then toward the label, you know, toward the inside of the disc. That's why we were, with the audiophile discs, a lot of them are at 45 RPM. And they don't and, cut too far in. And we don't want to cut close to the label. So all of these factors we have to take into consideration. So disc cutting has a lot of limitations if you're not careful. So uh, it's art and science, it's, right? It, it is. It has a lot to do with that, and it has. A, you have to have an ear for, uh, you know, what kind of losses you can you can tolerate almost. Do you yeah. compensate for knowing that the high frequencies are going to roll off? They're going to attenuate because of the grooves are squ squishing together. Do you? Add EQ, brighten it as you as you cut towards the center. Or? No, we tend not to do that because it just compounds the problem. It just gets hashier and hashier if you do that because it's really a form of distortion, and it's not like it's not only that the fr high frequencies are rolling off because the stylus can't even fit in the edges of the groove wall. Uh, if you just force it and put more high end on it, 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 it actually, the thing where you're gonna get is a lower part of the curve, which is the mid-range, it'll get edgier and harsher. So, uh, and you get more distorted. So you're not a big uh, fan of Dynagroove? Well, Dynagroove, that was a little different. Dynagroove, they were trying to solve some of those problems, but that was also, they were changing the frequency response depending on the level of the signal, even on the outer edge. That, yeah. that never worked. Really, really no, it was a that. <laughs> terrible. And, and well, but see, there's another case of, yeah, it would be nice if you could do some of that maybe. Right. But in order to do it, it takes all kinds of electronics and processing. So now you've destroyed the, the sound of the original music to make it uh, maybe be a little cleaner in a certain way, but the quality just generally is not good. You know, yeah. the, the whole thing is affected then. So you're you're not running this tape machine through your board, are you? You're running it. Well, this th in this case, uh, uh, we're we're really being purists on this one because it was mixed so well. Uh, we're we're going to go direct to the cutting system. We're going to go direct to the lathe. So you, so that might be the the guy from uh, United. Okay, well let's stop.
Okay. A little test cut there to make sure we've got the right. Clean that width. stylus now. Yeah, clean it. This is a new stylus too. For this occasion, we changed it. Okay. Now. Make sure that we're set up here. Mm -hmm. That looks good. I didn't know you were making Fiddler on the roof. <laughs> Ah, Fiddler on the Roof. Okay, we're underway. Also, that head, the preview head isn't supported, so it's wobbly. It's wobbly. Because the second track's really short, 11 minutes at the most. Oh, okay. Yeah. We should be good, yeah. The, the longest side is the sixth side. That one's 12, 12 and a half minutes. Now, if you talk too loudly, will the head pick it up and, and put it on the record? Well, you got to really be loud. Be close. Right? Yeah, close. To, to make that whole mechanism. It's very rigid, the mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you walked over to it and yelled in the head, it would, it would get it would on register. it. system way back when they were trying to make this more automated, but mm -hmm. it really wasn't a good idea. You could put a little reflective uh, tape, stick it under the recording the tape, mm -hmm. and, and, and it would, the photo cell would make the spread. Oh! Yeah. But that's a lot of trouble. And you can really see it coming because it splices stuff. 